It is just great to be here today, and I know you had a long day already, um, but the program is so um, well designed. Uh, I want to thank Paul and everyone else from the diversity committee who has put it together for the students. Um, I've been here now for more than 10 years and being part of this diversity series, and which actually should be called the diversity and social justice series to be really clear about it, that we not just embrace diversity, but we also understand and recognize the, the social injustices that go along with it. Um, I'm, I, this has been one of the best things I've been part of, and if I can squeeze in some time, I'll, I'm always been happy to be uh, on the listening side uh, of these programs. Um, it's so important that disability or the issue of disability as a diversity and social justice issue uh, is on our mind. It's certainly something that I'm, I feel um, ignorant about in so many ways. And um, I, have a similar, I have a similar story I could share about my own sister and what it has taught me uh, and, and the many things I need to learn about it. Um, the theme um, and I, I was so glad I had the chance to you know, introduce Susan right away. But she, when, when, when I spoke with her the first time, she's, she, we, we talked about what could be the theme of, of this entire year. And she said, when you think about accessibility. Accessibility in so many ways defines um, equal opportunities for people with disabilities. Um, sometimes I struggle with the language. Do we call this disabilities? Do we call it impairments? Do we call it differences? And I'm sure you will talk about that. Hopefully I will get enlightened about those things today. Um, safety are issues, freedom for, from abuse, neglect, violations of patient rights. All these things are so crucial when we talk about disabilities. Um, but I'm, I want to be brief today because, again, I'm certainly one who doesn't know much about it. Uh, so I'm delighted that we have uh, Susan Parker here with us, and, and Susan is a grad from our school. She graduated um, at the time with a master's degree in psychiatric social work and social planning community organizing from our own school. Some people say that that was the time the school was at the highest peak. Um, I'm going to question that. Um, Susan definitely is at the highest peak when you get into disability achievements or in, the, in terms of the field of disability. She has been a leading expert in disability policy development and implementation. She has held high-level positions in government and non-governmental organizations. She served as the executive director of the New Hampshire Developmental Disabilities Council and was commissioner of mental health and developmental services of the state of Maine. She served at the ILO in Geneva, has extensive international experience in this regard, and her most recent position includes a senior executive service post at the US Department of Labor's first director of disability policy and research, and then the director of policy development. She retired, she said to me, uh, exactly a, a year ago. So this is a sort of a celebration of that year ago retirement. We're delighted to have her here. We were just very, very lucky because this is the only day of the month that she actually could come. Paul, you were lucky. Um, so I'm very pleased to welcome Susan Park. Hello, good people. I remember how nervous I was in my first uh, week of uh, you know, Boston College Graduate School Social Work Education. And I can remember being bowled over uh, by the professors, and it's true. Um, back in those days, we could uh, divide, and I came in with about three years worth of, uh, I will say, rock'em sock'em uh, 1970s version of community organizing and psychiatric social work at the most basic field level. So. Despite that, and um, humility, I take that from Sarah, very good point. Um, a lot of us thought we knew something about building community services systems back in Vermont in the mid-70s. Um, we were quite brash, um, but it was one of those learning experiences where, if anything, you realize 
at the end of some very key interactions with what I would call then the establishment, uh, the Veterans Administration uh, that was treating returning uh, Vietnam era veterans. Um, also the people that the psychiatrists who were then quite godlike uh, in the brand new community mental health centers and the people that were running the welfare systems. They thought that we, and we were trained as hospital improvement program people, uh, they thought that um, our attitudes, which really did put people first, uh, we trained ourselves, um, were just uh, off the wall. So I'm going to start with uh, a little bit of those reminiscences, but I'm going to uh, talk quite a lot about the values. Uh, values are critical. I heard Ruth McCoy saying uh, so. It is true. I heard Sarah give you three very cogent examples <clears throat> about the importance of values. Um, it has threaded through each one of my practice areas. And yes, my affinity certainly always has been since I was first introduced it, to it. And I say that disability in my growing up time in northern Maine, which was a French-speaking town, uh, it almost reached out and grabbed me. I was uh, just naturally interested in people that were um, not receiving justice from the system. As part of the essay into to get into Boston College, I can remember that I, uh, sometimes when you're an English major and a French major as an undergraduate, you get a little wordy and a little descriptive. So I told, them, I told an anecdote about how when I was in the fourth grade in East Millinocket, Maine, I had uh, a kid that sat just in front of me named Armand Morneau, yes, very French, and um, the teacher in the fourth grade was just extremely unenlightened and she used to pound the dickens out of people's knuckles if they didn't speak English in the classroom. Many kids could not because they didn't speak English at home. So in my first willful act of civil disobedience, I jumped up, grabbed the rubber-tipped pointer from, uh, her name was Annie Smith's hands, and said, wait a minute, you can't do that. Not his fault. His parents have never taught him English because they don't know it either. Well, I thought that was a revelation. And she thought I was totally impertinent, and I had 40 hours of detention at the age of 10. So <laughs> I got to... I got noted pretty quickly as being the one that would speak out, even from age 10. So, all that aside, social work, uh, social work education was absolutely uh, made for me. And um, there, anyway, it was just made for me, and my heart is there, and soul is there as well. So thank you, uh, Paul Klein, for getting me down here today. Uh, it is a celebration after being one year out of the world of senior executive service in the U.S. government. Um, I had to uh, go through a cooling off period of one year where I was not allowed to uh, advocate for anybody uh, who might want uh, money or whatever else from the U.S. Department of Labor. And guess what? Starting tomorrow, September 11th, banner day, I can do it. <laughs> and I shall. So, um, before I put this talk together, I always start, I guess this is casework training, I started with reading again the New Social Frontier, which is a stunning uh, Boston College 2011 publication, and it features a section on page 22 about mental health. Professor Klein is there, and it has some words on diversity, and I'm gonna repeat those in a couple of seconds, but firstly, Values are a bedrock. Bedrock is something we know real well in New Hampshire. We got a lot of granite and we talk about uh, granite state a lot, but values are a bedrock of any practice, whether it's micro or, ma or macro. Um, you need to know your values, I need to know my values, and we need to know where those values mesh with the diversity initiative, which I think are almost a perfect fit. Many mistakes have been made in the past, and I'll talk about mistakes, but then I'm gonna spend the balance of time on solutions, and also give you a little bit of history by referencing cross-disability groups. Um, the mistakes were made in direct service work and also in policy development and in policy design. Uh, the values of the helpers, along maybe even 30 years ago, were judged uh, after a number of years to be so far out of step with the best interests of people with disabilities, their families, and or caregivers. 
that uh, it was strong enough to engender uh, people going into protest mode, which is how I worked in the first mental health center in 1975. Values we should remember are not static, they change. That's true in all countries. They reflect gains made in science and in the effect of new findings of social service and educational research on, for example, expectations about what is possible in human behavior. So as a social worker, you need to know and be aware of the various threads that are crossing uh, crossing in science and how the scientific developments are able to influence your practice. Medical science, for example, has made huge gains affecting the survival rates of premature infants, accident victims, and the badly wounded soldiers on the battlefield. I think it's obvious now with me uh, reinforcing uh, the values as presented by your previous uh, several speakers that you need to go through an exercise of articulation of those values and it was often a missing element in early practice. Uh, my values, just so I'm not pulling wool over anyone's eyes, is that the whole person be treated, that the person's strengths be built upon and that service delivery systems recognize the inherent individuality of each person. Using such values as spiritual and conceptual guides will lead to policy development that is designed to capitalize on the abilities of an individual, not the disabilities. Whenever you see that word disabilities, you know, don't you, that uh, people will focus on that which is negative, that which is deficient. Not a good thing. Let's look at what works. Holistic health across physical, mental, and spiritual domains focus on ability. Values from the bedrock upon, values are the bedrock upon which effective practice rests. And you can look um, in some of the uh, policies and practices related to federal policy in the United States, also other countries, and you can pretty much determine uh, what kind of uh, individual and what the attitudes are or were that created policies. And you will know if you are watching and become a student of, say, the European Union, uh, that they have completely changed what their value structures are uh, across all those 27 members of the European Union. It doesn't mean that implementation is happening evenly in those 27 countries. What it means is that, is that the expectation is present that it shall change. Um, the, B, the Boston College Diversity Initiative uh, is something I think that uh, you may want to um, count your blessings that you have. Uh, not every place has it, and now I'm going to do the little quote. And it says, we continuously seek to grow our appreciation for the uniqueness of people as members of a particular ethnic, cultural, or spiritual and or religious group, and the power of those traditions to strengthen our own professional interventions. That, in my humble opinion, is right on the money. Understanding how to effectively apply our diversity to individuals and groups is mandatory. It's basic practice. Let's cut to the chase and understand how we as social workers can tailor our practice uh, to more effectively meet the people with the needs, or meet the express needs of people with disabilities. In order to do that, you have to have a relationship with people with disabilities. And now let's go to some solutions before I get into some histories. We can start first by understanding who the people are, not as statistics, although you should know that, or a cohort with various characteristics that are similar. Example, your uh, friend or your family member with uh, epilepsy. But people with intellectual impairments or mental illnesses um, are a category, but they are individualistic within that category. So too, people with mobility impairments, veterans with post-traumatic stress, disorders or traumatic brain injuries. We apply our appreciation of an individual's uniqueness uh, 
that just happens to include a disability. And it's a little bit like a gestalt. Remember that, those figure ground exercises that you may have taken? And if you look at it one way, you see um, a woman who was quite old. And if you uh, look at it another way, you see someone from the Edwardian period. You know, I just love those exercises because often I get, you know, I see the optimistic and I always see the, the pretty stuff first. Then I have to sort of say, hmm, hmm, hmm. Uh, lateral thinking, stretch, stretch, stretch. How else to see this, you know, this collection of uh, graphics on a black and white page? We do the same thing, uh, I think, in our assessments. We put the disability where it needs to be. It is not necessarily in the foreground. Secondly, we should have a look at ourselves. That means all of us. We don't uh, age out of the need to periodically self-examine, and we don't age out of answering the questions about how we regard disability. In short, uh, what's your orientation to disability? A, is the disability itself the limiting factor uh, in a person's ability to live, work, and play in civil society, or is it B, the negative reaction of elements uh, in the social environment that limit the ability of the person with disability to live, work, and play in his chosen environment. Well, I'm opting for B. That's me. But um, that's, that is for you as um, practitioners to also go through that exercise for yourself. As I said, it's a question of figure and ground. It's also um, learning to appreciate unique characteristics there's richness um, in diversity, and I'm sure that you realize that a majority of disabilities are individual. Here's an example. And I used to say this in Washington all the time. Now, Washington is, yes, I will say it, since I'm now one year out, it's egocentric. And here's why. Uh, they, will have, they will say, well, the greatest uh, disability in America is X. And then what happens, uh, they will say the second most frequent disability is Y, and the third one is Z. And they will say, um, because uh, we have these various weightings of numbers and incidents prevalence, um, we should be putting a lot of money here and not so much here and even less over here. Well, the, the way to uh, invite new perspectives in uh, America is to say, and are you counting the invisible disabilities? Because most recently, the advocacy, advocacy makes noise, as we all know, um, the advocates um, often are the ones with the most visible disabilities. They get noticed. Wheelchair chairs are hard to ignore, very good. Uh, but the most prevalent disability, according to the World Health Organization, is true in the world and true in America. It's people with hearing impairments. An impairment uh, may not um, be a full-fledged deafness, but it's an impairment it usually requires some sort of augmentative device in order to level the playing field so that you can hear. But that will usually... Um, alter the perceptions, whether it's with congressmen uh, or committees on the Hill that have their favorite programs, and they all do, uh, or people that are advocating for certain, to obtain certain types of funds. You really always need to have your facts and your figures, but also your senses of the figure in the ground. And Recently, and this always happens at state level, and often it, uh, this is invisible at the national level, but it's going on, is that it will be one disability pitted against another for certain funds. And staff on Capitol Hill will say, on the uh, Senate Help Committee, which is Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions, um, they'll say, well, would you rather give it to um, blind education or can we put some of it into developmental disabilities? They will actually say that to uh, advocates who are paid by their trade organizations to uh, present the best case for you know, the various camps, just so you know that that's part of the reality. All right, um, <clears throat> politically and thankfully, consumers, that is the people with disabilities themselves, are now part of the debate and the discussion uh, processes at the state and federal levels of government. That has not always been so. Um, I started out this little uh, talk by saying, my goodness, um, when I first started in 1975 or thereabouts, uh, 
uh, we had um, practitioners who were psychiatrists, and we had uh, long-time uh, administrators of social welfare programs that were, um, if I had a word, uh, it might be they were firmly, large and in charge and firmly entrenched. And they did not believe that uh, a person with uh, a mental illness in Vermont had, should it be, um, should have an opinion about how services ought to be delivered. They thought that they knew better. Well, that's what my little group, we were five or six people, that's what we were protesting, because we knew that that wasn't the case. And uh, we made their lives miserable at budget allocation time, uh, mainly because we knew if we didn't say something that the stereotypes and the narrow thinking would be allowed to uh, ferment and it was not a good situation. Money can bring out the best, money can bring out the worst. And when you have individuals who are not regarded as legitimate to have their own voice, um, occasionally in order to right a wrong, and it is social justice, it is a, an element in social justice, what you have to do um, sometimes we were a bit over the top, but here's what we did. Um, some of us chained ourselves to the state house door, thinking that we could get the press there, and the press would say, would take up our opinion, and would at least uh, give us, you know, front page coverage, which they did, and which we were able to publicize the fact that um, life is not better in the Vermont State Hospital. Life should be better if we developed the way the federal legislation said we should. Comprehensive community mental health centers, you know, with a uh, core set of services to enable people to live, work, and play in the community. Well, <clears throat> that history of the mid-70s uh, was preceded by some interesting things that at one time were mainstream, and I agree uh, with uh, Professor McCoy that you've got to know the history. Uh, why? Um, I call it, because I'm a, sort of a northern New England person, I say you've got to know where the footsteps in the snow have trod before. Because dollars to donuts, it's going to happen again. And now it is happening again. Uh, we do have um, a return to institutions because the uh, money is tight and people believe that, uh, lawmakers believe that it's a cheaper way out uh, to house people. But uh, more of that later. Um, people with disabilities have been among our human population for millennia. No surprise, is it? Um, disability is part of the human condition, and today we often speak in this era of rights, we speak of um, temp being temporarily able-bodied. All of us are temporarily able-bodied in the language of people first. And it's a phase of human evolution. There's a large body of literature on disability histories, and if, they're, if the writers are uh, paying attention, and often the writers uh, who are chronicling what happened to people with mental illness do go back into uh, the dark ages of treatment, which were, would be the 1700s, 1800s, uh, they will talk about how people who were deviant or different were really uh, shunted aside. There were preconceptions about people who were different. Um, in some countries today, and even in parts of America today, those um, senses of deviance are still with us, and they need to be challenged at every turn, because where there is a sense of deviance um, and differentness, and fear, which is a, again, epilepsy is one of those, uh, people feel that they need to separate themselves out from it and that somehow the person with a disability is somehow at fault. And of course, that is very far from the truth. Disability in some parts of the world, uh, in, in some places in America, is regarded as a black mark. Um, it could mean uh, it's a sign of the devil's mark on a family, or it may be regarded as retribution for something an ancestor or someone in present life uh, did, and the family is being punished by producing uh, a family member with disabilities. Um, 
people with disabilities in, ver in many cultures, and it was formally true in the United States, are usually at the end of the supply line uh, to receive food, clothing, shelter, and clean water. I've worked in cultures where that is so. Survival was dicey at best, and there are cultures today who interpret uh, that babies born with cleft palates uh, bring bad luck to their parents. And I already told you about the long gone ancestors uh, who may be foisting retaliation from beyond the grave. As time, uh, time, people do evolve, attitudes do evolve. Yes, science has a part of that, and blessedly so. But honestly, light bulbs in America did manage to go off, and it usually was coupled with um, perceived um, education and increased knowledge about uh, how people learn. And family members are those charged with caring for the chronically sick uh, who realize that reforms finally needed to be brought about in order uh, to make sure that proper care and opportunity could be given to people with disabilities. Some of the um, individuals who were singled out really for, um, I think, early uh, attention, uh, and it's always a result of some reformers uh, who had insights and who dared to buck the traditions. And bucking the tradition, I think, um, is a result of a lot of things, daring to do so. Um, but how many of you are familiar with the Perkins School here in Massachusetts? Yeah, good. Um, what you may not know uh, is that it is a very early example of what happened in America. A lot of things happened in Massachusetts that were the first ever, you know, having to do with disability, and that's a good thing. Uh, it has to do with the education that's here. It has to do with the fact that um, parents uh, understood that there was a way to make a difference. But the Perkins School came about because individuals had families that recognized that people with vision impairments or blindness could learn. But uh, there were certain techniques that needed to be given to them and that the way to do that was to bring these individuals into a um, I call it a cloistered setting, but a separate setting, and the Perkins family uh, decided to do that. Uh, what some of you may not remember, or why should you know it, but uh, I'm a you know, survivor of the Department of Labor, uh, and we know that the first Secretary of Labor was Frances Perkins. Guess where she was from? Right here. And same family, so a thread of enlightenment certainly um, has gone through that family for a very long time. The effects of early advocacy are visible, and no puns intended, but let's take a look at some of the cross disabilities. Uh, people who are blind or severely impaired, um, you probably know the histories uh, of Helen Keller and her teacher Annie Sullivan, does that make sense? She was both deaf and blind, and her teacher was Annie Sullivan, right around here. Um, the work that they did together to bring about greater awareness that these people um, not only could learn, but could live full and productive lives was of inestimable importance. That importance was realized also down in uh, the world of Washington, D.C., where one of the earliest pieces of policy and program, you have a policy that's legislation, then you have a program that implements the legislation, is the Vocational Rehabilitation Program. And to this day, you will see the effects of those reforms of the 1920s, and here's how you'll see it. In every single state uh, and territory, of which there are, what, 54, uh, you will see a Vocational Rehabilitation Program. In 27 of those states, you will see separate programs for people, uh, it's called VR, Vocational Rehabilitation for People Who Are Blind. And that is because there is a set aside in this enabling legislation that protects people with blindness. And you will see sprinkled throughout legislation um, other evidences like that that really uh, describe the legislative history pertaining to various individual uh, groups of people with disabilities. 
Um, you'll see another one uh, in the Social Security Administration. I was the Disability Commissioner in Social Security from 89 to 93. And it was, I thought I knew something. Well, you know, humility is uh, important because there's many things you always don't know. But if you look at the refinements in the disability legislation pertaining to Social Security benefits for, for disabled people, you will see there is a set aside for people who are blind in supplemental security income and their monthly stipend is a couple of hundred dollars more than everybody else belonging to dis different disability groups. This is a reflection of the effectiveness in today because SSI came in with 1972's uh, Family Reform Act. Um, you will see uh, examples where the two leading advocacy organizations for people who are blind, that's their effectiveness talking as it's applied to Capitol Hill. You will see similar things for people with intellectual impairments. Um, how many of you know the phrase intellectual impairments? Anybody? Okay, how many of you know the phrase people with mental retardation? Yeah, well, yeah, two or three here, two or three there. Um, the old term was to use the category of mental retardation. The, the term du jour uh, today uh, is you use the term intellectual disabilities, and that covers quite a broad uh, swath. But there was um, a fascinating story of effective advocacy that really began in the 60s, and this is a woman who knew um, President Kennedy very well. Her name was Elizabeth Boggs. PhD, where was her PhD from? I can't recall, but Stanford, I wanna say. But she had a PhD in physics, uh, and she was on the, what was called uh, the Manhattan Project in World War II, and she was a mover and a shaker. Uh, and she had a child, a son, with develop, what we call developmental disabilities. And she decided that the country was just absolutely backward as far as um, treating these individuals and we needed a system out in the community. So she gathered um, up other loyal people, including many from Massachusetts who were part of the Association for Retarded Citizens, usually cadres of parents of children with uh, then called mental retardation, and off they marched to Washington and they created the, a really a bedrock act, and it's still on the books today. It was passed around 74, 75, called the Developmental Disability Bill of Rights and Assistance Act. Ought to remember that if you're thinking about disability as a practice area because it covers, it's a broad cadre of people with disabilities people with what's called a developmental disability, but it, it pays for various functions in state government, among which number the uh, planning and development councils. I ran the New Hampshire Developmental Disabilities Council. Another one is the Protection and Advocacy Organization. Every state and territory has one. And the third category would be university-affiliated facilities. That's where the research money is and the demonstration money. And wouldn't you know, this organization uh, as a federal entity called ADD is still in existence and it's still in uh, Health and Human Services as a separate division in Washington, D.C. Well, if you fast forward uh, from the years, something like you know the early part of the 20th century, when the asylums, you know the word asylums, that was a big part of service delivery. It, ironically, if you're a planning student like I once was, you learn that as the asylum movement was, is a derivative of the um, land use planning movement that created places like Central Park, green places for the urban masses to retreat to on their weekends, you know, respite from the sweatshops is the way I used to call it. Uh, but the asylums were created as places of health, and you have examples, health and uh, clean living and uh, a place to go and get healthy. And America uh, had a huge tradition in asylums. And you have many of them here in Massachusetts. Now they are not so much a residence, uh, 
as they are places where services are housed as far as administration. Here are some of the names. Rentham, do any of you know Rentham State School? Belchertown, a uh, very well-known one out in the western part of the state. State of Maine had the Pineland School, if anybody knows that state. Uh, Laconia State School. These, if you're studying um, law and you're looking at the use of the law to create social change, you realize that the abuses that, that were then documented by the time of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, Willowbrook is another one in New York State on Long Island, very famous. Um, they're famous not for good reasons. They're famous because the legal aid uh, uh, lawyers, uh, public service lawyers that were new to the job in the 70s, um, still persevere today despite a lot of budget cuts, but they, together with the U.S. district courts, created class action suits. Now, why is that important? It's important because in this practice area, we use the law to make social change, and we um, used the class action suit to create large service systems in the states uh, and handed the decisions off to the governors and the legislatures with remedies and court orders to implement those remedies. We had in New Hampshire the Laconia State, uh, the Laconia School suit, it was called Garrity versus Gallon, uh, and that one uh, was actually planned by the Developmental Disabilities federally funded uh, staff just before my time. And the actual design and the implementation and evaluation of that first system was then carried out by a DD, uh, Developmental Disabilities Council. So that is why I reference both the um, Developmental Disabilities Bill of Rights and Assistance Act, but also tell you about the asylum movement and how a social good uh, in the days of Jane Hull became a real social negative um, 80 to 90 years later. And it's still a social negative. So it was the parents and family members who advocated against these institutions and they were successful. Now what we see um, in the year 2011, and it began about five or six years ago, is that there is a backsliding on the financing and the uh, implementation of community services for all types of people with disabilities. That includes the mentally, people with mental illness and their families, uh, people with uh, intellectual impairments, people with physical disabilities. They all have separate funding streams, which is a real problem. Uh, because, um, well, as I said before, when funding gets tight, they fight each other and it's cannibalizing. Uh, and with weak, and I understand what weak means, but weak political leadership, um, these individuals um, are allowed uh, to fight off each, or fight each other, and the politicians will not stand up and say, hey, wait a minute, there is a solution here, and this is how we really need to proceed. So, predictably, um, actually people that began their professional careers as uh, litigation um, conceptualizers and people who created uh, litigation and who actually argued the cases in New England are doing it again. And I just learned uh, two weeks ago that a case has been filed in New Hampshire to benefit the people with long-term mental illness because of the, for the absolute lack of community services. And um, I can't remember the names of the representatives of the class action, but it's versus Jim James Lynch, who is this who's the outgoing governor uh, as of November or January of 2013. And uh, I just signed on uh, this morning uh, to be on the board of the group uh, overseeing uh, this litigation, and I'm happy to do so. But it's what is not lost on me is how we have gone full circle from 1978 to now, uh, 30-odd years later, and we're uh, going to sue the state. And the first district, uh, the federal uh, court in the first district has already agreed uh, to um, work uh, and to advocate with us. And now the lawyers are in the stage of actually uh, doing what they call discovery. You know what discovery is? 
It means you have people who have been aggrieved and those individuals um, need to come in and tell their story. And uh, you do an awful lot of discovery. And then the judge uh, of this, uh, in this district, will decide whether or not it contains all of the merits of being a uh, class action suit. So that's social change uh, right now, at least in one state. Now, what can we do as social workers to facilitate maximum growth of people with disabilities? Because that's what we're, that's what we're about, isn't it? We're not trying to uh, apply our craft so people can move backwards. Um, we're supposed to use strengths, build on the strengths, and what can we do to move forward? So I have a little list here, and there are many. This is not mutually exclusive by any stretch and understand ourselves and how we individually regard people with disabilities. What do we have in common? Believe me, we do. And what's different? And be honest with yourselves. Secondly, take an active stand to debunk stereotypical thinking relative to people with disabilities. For example, many well-meaning people um, assume that people with mental illness, if they have been hospitalized, and many have, they're predisposed to violent behaviors after discharge. This is stereotypical thinking and has a very negative effect on the ill person's ability to integrate back into communities. Tough enough to live with the illness, it's made far more difficult than it needs to be when you have unenlightened people around the individual saying, oh my God, I can't do anything with you because jeepers, you know, um, you can lash out and do something nasty to me. There's this misconception that a person in a hospital who has been hospitalized, all of them are violent. And you see the, the problem here. They're painting a whole group of people with a single paintbrush. It's, it's not right. And we say, we use the word stigma. Stigma is a word that means they come out of that hospitalization and they are stigmatized by people that don't necessarily know anything about the illness. It's like saying a person with cancer or a person with, um, if you travel a lot and work in some parts of the world, you're often exposed to uh, a certain type of tuberculosis or malaria. It's like, you know, if you have any of these diseases, somehow um, if you're side by side with someone else, you're automatically going to transmit that disease to them. And uh, it's, it's, it's not uh, based on, shall we say, knowledge. And three, take the time to analyze service delivery systems. Uh, the policies of both state, federal, and I, I would add to that local, uh, that guide the programs um, for the purposes of determining what people can do and can't do as far as the programs. Everything has um, a stamp. Everything has a flavor. You can tell. Uh, what the attitudes are of people, uh, what the attitudes of the decision makers were by uh, how those laws are written. Take the time to read them. Um, I will tell you that the consumer movement, whether it's in the field of mental health or in the field of developmental disabilities um, or in mobility uh, training, the field of um, consumerism is alive and well and very vociferous and very politically savvy. And they have tried uh, valiantly in the last uh, 10 to 15 years to actually make current a lot of the laws that are on the books in their respective states. Another thing I'd recommend is examine uh, the service systems in other countries. And I know that is, can be a tall order, but it's always useful to understand the divergent values of other groups and the way they, and the language they use. Uh, in the old days in America, America's not perfect. Uh, we are on an evolutionary path, positive most times. But in the bad old days, we used words uh, in our legislation at the state level, the imbeciles. Um, people with, uh, another old one for the mentally ill was dementia prycox. All that was was a catch-all term that they didn't really know what was going on. So they gave it a name. They figured if they named the baby, then they could justify certain things they were doing. Um, and, you know, you, you're probably sitting there in a state of incredulity uh, because you can't believe that we were once so unenlightened.
about uh, people with disabilities, but it's true. And it really has been in the last 25 to 35 years where we've taken the bull by the horns um, for a lot in a, using a lot of different methods and ma tried to uh, make things a lot better. Um, understand how bureaucracies work. I have a key question that I'll pass on to you, and I used it every day. And I've been in several large <laughs> bureaucracies. Um, where is the gray line between the bureaucracy serving itself and serving others? And I'll tell you, uh, the best policy document uh, in any bureaucracy is the budget. Look and see what's in the budget that can benefit uh, people with disabilities. And don't be, as the Brits would say, gobsmacked by uh, you know, the seeming uh, meaningless array of numbers because someone knows what those numbers mean. You can find out. But take a look. You know, the federal government has you know, government documents uh, that are there. You can get hold of like health and human services budget. It's about that thick. You can do the same thing uh, with the Department of Labor or the Social Security Administration. But you have to look at the admin section of these things uh, and then their grant programs. And lastly, uh, take action to prevent the erosion of resources allocated to effective programs. You've got to know what's happening because the budget is the primo uh, policy document. Watch what's going on with those resources. Um, are, they t are they taking cuts in the grant section or in the formula grant section that pay for services for people with disabilities or are they taking it out of their own administration? And um, you may have opinions on what it is they might be doing, but take the time to look. And I would commend you especially to have a look at health, education, employment, and transportation. Susan, so much of your presentation had to do with uh, the power of advocacy, and yet mm -hmm. uh, I know it, it can be, it can feel dangerous and reckless to be an advocate, to speak out when mm -hmm. others are silent. I wonder if you have anything to say about the stress associated with being an advocate or strategies for taking care of yourself and being effective as an advocate for others. Yeah, I do. Um, I do agree that it can be stressful, but there is strength in numbers. And understand who your allies are. That's uh, fact number one. Uh, fact number two is that um, you do not need to pillory yourself and make an example of yourself because you need to live to fight another day and understand that this is an evolutionary process um, and you cannot afford uh, to, I call it burnout, but um, lose your sense of uh, fire in the belly uh, because you have overextended. When you're feeling like, oh my gosh, I'm the only one in here, nobody cares about it as much as I do, that is a, that is a clue for stepping back and having a big look at yourself and uh, where you are, because it probably means that you're tired. And many of you I know who have chosen to come into this field um, have a wonderful heart and spirit uh, and intellect. And it will be easy for you to uh, use a great deal of your uh, innate collateral and maybe overextend it. So, uh, the watchword is always be careful. Hey, sound familiar, Paul? <laughs> We've been there. I'm just wondering if Alberto has a separate fund for bail in case as a part of our <laughs> civil disobedience we haven't well, ended up in the cahoots <laughs> yeah. uh, You have very valuable tools as social workers and uh, your information can be hot. I noticed that you talked a lot about language and how it changes over time, you know, mm -hmm. how it's sort of in this day and age repulsive that we would call people with disabilities um, imbeciles, but then that turned into mentally retarded, which at that time was very politically correct. And then at this time it becomes intellectual disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, I understand that those words become bad, which is why we have to change them because kids can use them negatively, etc. But what do you think changing the language actually does if those words that are once politically correct sort of inevitably become offensive 10 years later. 
I think there's, um, <clears throat> I think it's nothing that you can um, always anticipate and that you just have to remain cognizant that language evolves and to understand, and th th my arbiter for this is how do people with disabilities talk about themselves first? And I, that's where I take my cues. Um, and that's why I say, uh, take the time to get to know a person with disabilities and see what they say. Um, I'm, uh, I, I don't have good feelings, and I divined yours too, um, about being politically correct. Um, I usually use people's first names if I can. Um, it's only when I'm in, you know, more formal situations and I'm making illustrations do I, you know, go through this uh, people with disabilities business. But in real life, uh, I would say, you know, if I were in a conversation, I would not be doing that one-on-one -on -one, or even with families. But um, families and people with disabilities know exactly how they wish to be. Uh, called and I um, worked for years in the Department of Labor with uh, youth and one of my uh, bureau chiefs um, was a um, is because she's moved on uh, is a person uh, with quite a s uh, severe disability and I would I got I, I guess I'm at the stage where uh, I call her Jennifer and I don't even think about the disability and that's what happens and that will happen to you too. And that is what I prefer because it's the people part. Okay? Great, thank you so much, All Susan. Right. Hey, you're welcome. <laughs> Pleasure to be here. <laughs> on oh behalf of the diversity committee on oh, the social it's a work, diverse basket. <laughs> we'd like to offer you this gift <laughs> as a well, thank you very, very much. Well, thank you. Thank you. Good talk to you. Thank you. Thank you.